Hi, it's Tim Huff, uh, mining analyst from Peel Hunt here. Uh, with us today is the CEO of Wheaton Precious Metals, Randy Smallwood. Randy, thank you very much for taking the time to meet up with us today, do a brief interview. Um, Always a pleasure to talk to you. Good to hear. Um, I guess we're going to cut right into the questions, but um, I mean, given the tough year that we've had, 2020 was like a, a year like no other for most people, but particularly the mining industry and, and Wheaton in particular. Um, but you've seemed to come out of 2020 relatively unscathed and in a stronger financial position than when you went into the pandemic. So I mean, given that that's the backdrop, I guess, firstly, from an operational perspective, you had a, a handful of operations that were temporarily suspended in the second quarter due to government mandates uh, to curb the spread of the pandemic. But again, your portfolio weathered the storm better than most. Why do you think that was? Uh, and I guess from, again, operational perspective, what were the greatest challenges or maybe lessons that you think Wheaton faced and learned during the year that helped you help strengthen the company and the team? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, no doubt, uh, 2020 was a very challenging year, and it's, and it's definitely impacted uh, some of us uh, a lot more than others. The mining industry, we actually did relatively well. Uh, most mines are in remote locations and have, uh, have pretty good abilities to control risk and travel and tran you know, transient movement and, 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 and risk management. And so the industry did relatively well, but we did have some suspensions, as you mentioned, uh, both Mexico and Peru suspended mining operations for uh, up to two months, uh, look at, it was between six, six weeks and two months. Um, but I think if there's one thing that, that benefited Wheaton, it's the, uh, it's the fact that the quality of the investments that we, uh, that, that we select, um, we judge assets, we judge our investments by, um, by their operating margins. And we're always looking for assets that are in the first or second quartile. And what that means is that not only are these assets incredibly profitable for us and our shareholders and stakeholders, but for all stakeholders, for the operators, for the communities, for the governments, they generate substantive uh, benefits for everyone all the way across, uh, all the way across the spectrum of stakeholders. And so it's very important that these assets continue contributing and everyone has an aligned interest in terms of moving that on a, on a go forward basis. And so, so what, you know, what we saw was reaping some benefits, I believe, from having good high quality production or 90% of our production. We have 24 different mines delivering us metal now. 90% 90, 90 of our production came from the bottom half of the cost curve. And I believe 74% of that's actually the, for the bottom quartile of the representative cost curves. Those high margins means that there was an aligned interest in terms of making sure that these assets continue to deliver uh, the benefits to all the stakeholders all the way across the board. And so in the end, we had, we had a slight miss, but it was nowhere near as bad as what we've seen elsewhere in the industry. Um, you know, it's, uh, and in the end, I, I do believe, you know, what, what happened was there was a real strong incentive from all, from all parties, from all stakeholders to do what they can to minimize the risk and uh, minimize the impact uh, um, of, of, of the pandemic. And, uh, and of course, all the stakeholders did reap the benefit of those efforts, including ourselves. Yes, and, and the continuity is an, important, is an important point there because from a CSR and an ESG perspective, continuity of mining operations has a big impact or can have a big impact. Wheaton has been a leader on the, on the ESG front mm -hmm. uh, with your focus on supporting partners, but also community projects around the mines. And you've been doing this for quite some time, well before the pandemic started. Right. Maybe could you talk a, a bit more about maybe how your how you approach ESG, how that's developed over time, but particularly how that also evolved over the past year. Well, look, it's a it's a simple equation. We we get benefits from these operations. We 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 owe it to society as a whole to make sure that we deliver sustainable benefits back to the other stakeholders that are impacted and, and benefit from these uh, from these operations. And so Wheaton has long had a strong commitment towards focusing, you know, uh, and adding support. It, we do have this overlying mantra here in, in Wheaton in that the stronger our partners are, the stronger we are. So we owe it to our partners to continue to, to help uh, strengthen them and, and, and help them outperform in, in their own role as they operate these mines. And, and one of the best ways to do that is to uh, expand their capacity to deliver strong social license or to obtain strong social license. And that means making sure that beyond the jobs and the taxation revenue and everything else that we make sure that we we do deliver uh, additional benefits to the communities. 
And so, um, you know, we've got a long track record of, of, of co-funding programs with our partners, which in the end makes them stronger, gives them stronger social license. Uh, in fact, in 2020, we came up with a special $5 million fund that, that provided additional support, again, to the front lines of, of people fighting this pandemic and minimizing risk. And so a number of different initiatives over and above our normal practice, just to try and lessen the impacts of this pandemic in, in you know, what is quite often very rural locations where you don't see the same level of support that you do in some of the urban locations. And, and so uh, it's a strong commitment of ours. It really comes down to just doing the right thing. Um, this is what we need uh, it, it is to make sure that the communities and, the, and, and, and all the stakeholders receive good long-term sustainable benefits from these operations. And uh, the better job we do at that front, the stronger we and our partners are. Yeah, and you, you mentioned expanding in there too, too which is very important. And um, 2020 posed, it posed so many problems to every mining company's M&A strategy. And most people actually fell short of all their M&A ambitions. Now, you guys were able to add three new streams to your portfolio in the past year. And um, maybe, can you, can you talk a little bit more about your, your DD process? Because due diligence was, was so key to you to executing, executing on those three streams. And for you, like everybody else, there were several limitations that were put in place as a re result of COVID, but you managed to work with them and deliver. Well, it's uh, again, it's just it's a, it's incredible how uh, how much you can get done on a computer, as, as everyone in the world knows in this pandemic uh, work from home mobile world that we're we're now living in. Um, you know, the bulk of due diligence does occur digitally. It, it it's going through um, drill hole databases, building models, and such. It's, it's mostly technical studies that are based on on computers and therefore can be completed. However, uh, I will never undersell the importance of, of a site visit and getting onto the ground and, and getting a smell, a feel for, for the actual um, you know, ore body itself and for the operation and talking to the talking face to face to not, not just hear what they're saying, but to see what they're saying, to, to get the body language from them. And so it's a very important aspect of good, strong due diligence. The pandemic, of course, has made that very challenging. Uh, we've done virtual drone tours. We've had virtual calls, obviously, uh, with with site staff and worked our way through this. Um, we have had some site visits, but it's in a very, very risk managed environment. And we're definitely not traveling overseas for any of those uh, site visits. What we're relying on, uh, what we have been relying on is in-country consultants. Um, but the consultants that we have used in the past and we have good strong faith in, in terms of being able to do a good job. However, I can assure you there's a long list of, uh, of, of sites that I wanna visit once, uh, once, once um, you know, travel restrictions relax themselves and go forward, it is something that you know, we're we're doing the best we can in this situation. We uh, we definitely would like to get on the ground, but we are still confident in terms of the decisions that we've made. Good to hear. Now, I guess um, putting the DD process aside for one second, maybe focusing a bit more on the assets specifically. Cozumel is a mine you already know well because it's been part of your portfolio before. I'd like to talk about each of them individually, though, because they're all very different. I mean, Cozumel, obviously an operating mine with immediate production. You've got Santo Domingo, flip side of the coin, which is on the development side, and, and Mormato, which is a, a combination of both of them. Maybe can you can you address each one of those in, independently and talk about why you liked each of them relative to maybe other opportunities that could have been available in the market? Well, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, Cozumel is an asset, as you mentioned, Tim. We had it in our portfolio from 2009 to 2017, so we have a long history with Cozumel. It was, uh, you know, we actually acquired that contract as part of a, a corporate acquisition where we took over a, a small-scale competitor back in 2009. So it was a term deal that uh, that we were sad to see disappear from 2017. Cozumel is a unique opportunity. It's a, it's down in the Zacatecas district of Mexico. That's got a long history of just continually replacing. What you've got is these, these very strong structures, continuous long running structures uh, that pass through that entire district down there. And, and once you tap into these structures, you basically work your way along and continue to add reserves, resources, and ultimately reserves and, and, and ultimately obviously ounces. If you look at Capstone's track record in terms of what they've done at, uh, at Cozumel since they acquired it back in the early 2000s, it's incredible how that asset has grown and continues to grow. 
And in fact, you know, earlier this year, um, they released some additional exploration success that really highlights what we uh, what we saw in this asset. And so, so really happy to have that molded back into our portfolio. Um, Santa Domingo, which is another capstone opportunity. Um, it's a development project. I, I have to, I'll be honest, we were a little bit skeptical going into that one, but the, we did a very deep due diligence to the point of pulling off our own metallurgical samples and doing some test work. Um, I have to say this, and this is a really good, strong asset. And so we're really excited to, to step forward with Capstone. You know, we think it's going to be the next stage in how Capstone grows their company and to be supporting them through this phase is, uh, is an honor really. And, uh, and this asset itself uh, just has some good, strong strengths to it. We actually came away uh, even more optimistic than we were when we went into that, uh, that due diligence. And so a nice development project that'll be uh, producing for us and um, Marmato, uh, you know, with Eris Gold um, down in um, um, Colombia, it's it's a unique uh, opportunity in the sense that there's 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 plenty of history of artisanal mining on this regional again a regional structural zone uh, with uh, with hundreds of, of veins and veinlets that uh, carry good gold grades and, and a bit of silver. Um, and what deeper drilling has shown over time is that these, the, all these uh, structures coalesce into a couple of discrete and very continuous, um, but much, much thicker structural zones at depth. And that's really what we're funding at Ramato is, uh, is the uh, commitment to go down and develop some of these deeper zones and bring them into production. Um, it, it's an interesting one because there's a lot of history on this asset from artisanal miners and, and as you can might imagine, it's got some got some baggage with respect to an environmental uh, uh, wasteland from those artisanal miners, and so so one of the things I'm particularly proud about with the Marmato opportunity is that we we committed to co-funding some some programs that will help minimize the impact of some of that historical artisanal mining in the district and and limit uh, uh, sedimentation controls and 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 or sedimentation impact and and uh, and some of the impacts from these artisanal miners uphill from where these uh, operations where the Marmato operations are and you know it's a calm it, it's just a good example of how you know working together we as an industry can uh, leave a better footprint yeah and with with respect to your your broader portfolio I mean you continue to deliver on opportunities from as small as development projects with a couple of years to production up to assets as large as Solobo um, at year end, Haven talked a bit about there being an incredibly healthy pipeline of projects in call it the 200 to $500 million range. I guess a couple, a couple things there. Number one, do you continue to see that, that pipeline being available to you? And, and within it, are there maybe some opportunities in the 1 billion plus 1 billion size that maybe help you diversify your, your larger project portfolio? Our opportunity set right now is about as, as full as we've seen it. Uh, we're probably reviewing about 15 different projects at various stages right now. And so this, uh, our, our normal sort of um, uh, menu has about uh, five to 10 projects. And so, so very, very strong interest in terms of stream financing. I think if, if people look at Capstone's performance once they announce the streams on both uh, Cozumel and Santo Domingo, you can see the benefits that streaming provides to the base metal companies. And, and that's where the opportunity set is coming from right now. It's not, it's not, we're not doing gold streams with gold miners or silver streams with gold miners or silver miners. We're actually acquiring precious metal streams from the base metal companies. And so, you know, if you look at the base metal industry, of course, we see copper now finally getting some, some reasonable pricing, some pretty attractive pricing in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the commodity price itself. We're also seeing some, some good strength for both lead and zinc and nickel. The base metal sector has been uh, in a slumber for many, many years. And I would say in the last six to eight months, what we've seen is that base metal uh, sector wake up and, and there hasn't been a lot of reinvestment into that space. And so now what we're seeing is, is a lot of companies and, uh, that, that are looking to uh, start looking at expansions and to grow and to invest back into the ground uh, with these uh, higher commodity prices, people are feeling a little bit more bullish about the future and want to invest in the future. Of course, our business at Wheaton is to deliver capital. And, uh, and, and the one other benefit to the base metal sector is that most base metal mines are pretty and capital intensive. They're usually much longer reserve lives. I think that's one of the reasons why we have such a long reserve and resource life in our own company at Wheaton, you know, in, in, in over 30 years of reserves and uh, just over 30 plus years of combined resources. 
a very, very uh, strong reserve and resource life. So they've, they've got longer reserve lives, but they're also much more capital intensive. And, and that means they need capital. And debt is incredibly cheap. We know that our own revolver that, that we like to use to fund our acquisitions uh, is now running uh, somewhere around 1.4% interest rates. So we know debt is incredibly cheap, but that's not what we compete against. What we compete against is the equity investment. And what we see is a bunch of base middle companies where their shareholders, of course, are very motivated to try this, grow this company without having to dilute themselves to any great extent. And there's always gonna be an equity component required in any type of capital investment that is, uh, that is, that is being considered for, for these companies as they find a path to growth. And, and that's where we compete well. It's when we can come in and purchase the precious metal stream on these base metal projects and satisfy the equity requirement from, from, a, from an investing perspective um, and we, of course, value those precious metals at a multiple that's much higher than what the market is valuing that company shares. That's just creating value. And, and that's one of the huge attractions. All you have to do is look at, you know, I've always said this, the, the, the streaming industry, completing a stream is, is one of the few ways that you truly do create value because typically our shares will go up in the announcement of a transaction and the partner shares will go up in the, on, the, on the announcement of a transaction. And that combination is truly a creation of value. And as long as we share that arbitrage with our partners, it's a truly win-win situation, helps these companies move forward. So, so healthy appetite for stream financing in the base metal sector, especially uh, those that have good precious metal streams. And uh, we're very busy on that front. Good to hear. And with respect, with, with respect to deploying capital, I imagine you, you remain indifferent with respect to in production versus longer lead time assets, as well as uh, preference for metal? Yeah, you know, uh, in terms of development versus operations, uh, there's no doubt there's a bit less risk with an existing operation because you've got a track record that you can do. You can do reconciliation studies and, and, and see how the asset has performed. With development projects, there is a bit more risk. So we do expect a bit of a higher return on that capital to reflect the fact that we are taking on a bit of risk with development projects. And so in, in the ideal world, I think we need a blend of both. Um, you know, we do have an incredible portfolio already, um, but it's nice to add on some existing operations to grow that portfolio, but it's also nice to have that longer term growth. What we have to recognize is that we are not a deal machine. We don't constantly make acquisitions. There's time to make acquisitions and there's times to harvest. And, and when it comes to harvest time, we do need to have some of those assets that are in that that development phase to continue to deliver growth through that harvest phase while we uh, while we build up our balance sheet and wait for the next time to that that you know that that the industry is ripe for making acquisitions and so so you know it's it's a good um, it's a good mix in terms of having you know uh, existing production and adding on immediate production but also looking for the development stuff from a from a you know from a metal um, perspective. To be honest, I, I'm, I'm actually a bit preferential towards silver. There's stronger fundamentals with silver. The challenge that I have with silver is that it's such a small market. Um, now that, that in itself is a bit of an opportunity, but uh, it's one of the reasons why it's got such high beta, such high volatility, is that so much of it is produced as a non-core byproduct. And, um, and, and it just, it's such a small market relative to gold. And so most of our opportunities we're looking at are, we're probably about two thirds gold opportunities. And, and, uh, and, and the rest is silver or a, or a combination of gold and silver. And so definite bias towards gold. We are only focused on precious metals. We do consider platinum and palladium precious metals, but we don't see a lot of opportunities in that space. I think there's one asset we're looking at that's got some platinum, palladium, but everything else is gold, silver focused, a bias towards gold. My preference is silver again. Um, the fact that, that so much of it is, uh, is in, in ever growing demand and the fact that we have seen peak silver production and, and I think 2020 was one of the lowest years of silver production uh, that we've seen in, 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 in a long time. Uh, all of that feeds towards better silver prices. Yeah, no, very true. And uh, we're, we're running up against time, but just one final one in there. Um, you're talking a lot about growth, your preferences, deploying capital as CEO of the firm. Are there any growth metrics or set of metrics that you personally would like to hit before oh. you start to look at maybe um, deploying that capital more towards returns instead of growth? I, uh, I, I really look forward to getting Wheaton up over a million gold equivalent ounces per year of production. It's a personal objective of mine. I don't think we're that far off. Uh, you know, our current guidance has us at 750,000 
gold equivalent ounces this year. Our average over the next five years, including this year, is 810,000. So you can see it's got to have some numbers over that. Our, we did release 10 year guidance, one of the few precious metals companies that actually will give you 10 year guidance going out of 830,000 gold equivalent ounces. And those numbers are all very conservative. Um, you know, the Slobo mine, which is an incredibly important asset for us, is going through a third phase of expansion right now. Uh, we haven't seen an optimized study there that uh, that that uh, that would commit towards uh, stockpiling low grade material and pushing that forward. If that you know we are expecting something from Valley in the next few months in terms of their mine plan, their updated mine plan at Salobo, and uh, and we fully expect that there should be some a real upside there. They're also talking about a fourth phase of expansion at Salobo, which uh, which of course isn't factored into any of that. And so so you know we we're well on our way towards a million gold equivalent ounces, but it is a personal objective of mine. I can uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to the day, and we'll continue to uh, look for opportunities to get there. That's great, Randy. Thanks so much for your time today. We really appreciate it, and best of luck to you and to Wheaton Precious Metals in the coming year. Tim, it was a pleasure. Thank you.